Niccolo and his brother Maffeo hadn't been home in 15 years. They weren't soldiers away on a long deployment or sailors lost at sea. Instead, they were traveling merchants who had gone off to make their fortunes. When they first set out, Niccolo left behind his wife and unborn son. The brothers left from Venice, Italy and headed east to Constantinople. This alone might have been enough to give them their first fortune. In the 1250s, Constantinople was a prime location for traders and merchants. Overland routes from the east to west and north to south met with water routes from the Mediterranean, Adriatic, and Black Seas, all of which made for lucrative trading and selling for a profit-minded individual. Constantinople itself was friendly to Italy thanks to a successful crusade that put Latin influences in power, and so the brothers enjoyed favorable tax rates, were able to dabble in politics, and had diplomatic immunity to boot. So favorable were the conditions that Niccolo and Maffeo spent several years conducting business before the winds of political change started blowing and they moved their operations north into the Crimea. A short time later, Constantinople fell and a new Byzantine Empire arose, one which did not appreciate the presence of Venetians in the city. On the north coast of the Black Sea, the brothers became part of what became known as the Golden Horde, part of the Mongol Empire. There, the brothers managed to become merchant partners with Burka Khan himself, though the civil war between Burka and his cousin Hulagu soon encouraged Nicolo and Maffeo to move on to parts further east. In Bukhara, Uzbekistan, they spent three years living, trading, and making money. But then, in 1264, who should come along but Hulagu Khan? Hulagu thought it might be time to get in touch with his brother, Kubla Khan, and chew the fat. As the grandson of good old granddaddy Genghis, they had lots to discuss about this empire they were sharing. Knowing that such discussions were often good for trade, Nicolo and Maffeo decided to go along and see what could be done for their bank accounts. What could be done was pretty lucrative. The brothers were received at the court of Kublai Khan in what is now Beijing with honors and great ceremony. There they spoke with the Khan about Europe and the present state of affairs. They traded information about politics and religion and conducted trade throughout the empire. Eventually, Kublai wished to send an emissary west and establish contact with the Pope himself. Not only that, so fascinating were the stories told by the two brothers that the Khan decided to invite 100 educated people to come back to his court and teach Christianity and Western customs to his people and to bring with them oil from the lamp in the Holy Sepulcher in Jerusalem. In order to aid their return to the Khan's court, he issued them a travel pass in the form of a three-foot-long solid gold tablet with the guarantee of safe passage and lodging along the way. Unfortunately, on their return to Europe, Niccolo and Maffio discovered that the Pope they knew, Clement IV, had died, and the church had so far been unable to make up its mind on his successor, so they had no one to whom they could present Kublai Khan's request. Under the advice of a friend, they returned to Venice to await the election of a new Pope, which wouldn't happen until 1271, three years after the death of Clement. Once again in Venice, Niccolo discovered that his wife had died several years before. Fortunately, his son survived and was raised by an aunt and uncle while awaiting his father's return. Niccolo used his time between popes to finally meet and get to know his son, Marco. Marco Polo. Together with his father and uncle, Marco would set out on the return journey to Kublai Khan, which would become world famous and help firmly establish the legendary Silk Road in everyone's mind. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. We, uh, we have to begin this episode with a bit of a correction and an apology. See, way back when, we did an episode on the development of gunpowder called Saltpeter. You can go back to listen to it if you want, but you'll notice right away that we spend some little time telling you about the travels of Marco Polo and his mysterious, unnamed brother. In fact, we make quite the point about his brother receiving no credit at all for having participated 
in the very same travels as Marco did. None of the adulation and fame that Marco received ever seems to have accrued to his brother in any way. And then we started preparing for this episode. And it suddenly became clear to us why it was that Marco's unnamed brother didn't get any credit. And the simplicity of the explanation is absolutely staggering and so obvious that we don't know why we didn't see it ourselves the first time. Look at the facts. Marco's father, Niccolo, leaves Venice while his new wife, Marco's mother, is still pregnant with him. He's then gone for 15 years. When Niccolo returns, he finds out his wife died very early on in his absence and that five or six-year-old Marco was taken in by his relatives to be raised. Where, we ask you, was his brother supposed to come from? There are no records of stepbrothers, no children of his aunt and uncle that Marco considered to be his brother, and certainly no brothers born of a subsequent union between his biological mother and father. The reason Marco's brother got no credit at all for participating in Marco's travels was because he didn't. Because he didn't exist. If we had to guess what happened in our original research, we'd guess that Maffeo jumped his place in line and got read as Marco's brother rather than Niccolo's. If someone would like to show us evidence to the contrary, we'd love to see it. But every authoritative source we can find says Marco was an only child. Which just goes to show you how confusing all the information can be when you start looking into the Silk Road. And we don't mean that one website boogeyman the nightly news likes to drag out of the shadows of the dark web to scare you with either. We mean the trade route that for centuries has allowed communication and trade between the West and the East and meant so much to the development and disasters of the world. Some of the information is even true. See, the first problem with the Silk Road is the book Marco Polo wrote about his travels with his father and uncle on their second trip out east. Because you'll note, by his own account, Marco wasn't the first to go all the way to China from Europe. Niccolo and Maffeo were ahead of him, and they'd already spent several years out that way getting rich and being influential. So Marco was, at best, the third European to go there. Except even that wouldn't be right. The ancient Greeks had been out that way several times, as had the Romans. Sure, it was rare, but they'd done it, often in search of precious metals. Even our buddy Pliny the Elder mentions contact with people from the land where silk came from, and no Roman merchant worth his salt was going to let a potential market the size of China go uncontacted when all they had to do was sail around a bit and come at it from the south. By the 2nd and 3rd centuries CE, contact had definitely been made between Europe and the East, and thriving trade and political activity was underway. Both ends of the Silk Road knew about each other and were making the best of it. So Marco's book, The Travels of Marco Polo, wasn't really about discovering all these exotic and far-off places no one had ever heard of before. People had heard of them, and been to them, and even conducted business with them. Heck, by the time Marco got out east, even the church had been hard at work and set up a few Christian churches along the way. Oh, and we have to stop calling it Marco's book. Marco didn't write it. Shortly after Marco got back from his trip, he ended up getting tossed in jail for a time thanks to his being a Venetian trying to defend Venice from the Genoese. Genoa didn't like that much, so when they captured him, they locked him up and tossed the key quite a long way away. In the subsequent three years, he spent much of it narrating his travels and experiences to fellow inmate Rusticello de Pisa. Rusticello was a semi-famous writer of Italian romances, particularly the well-received romance of King Arthur which kicked off a whole Italian and French interest in the Arthurian legend that lasted for several hundred years. In any case, Rusticello knew a good story when he heard one, or at least knew how to embellish a story well enough that it became a good one. So when Marco told the story of his travels to the author, Rusticello shined them up and got them published. It was his book more than it was Polo's. Subsequent study and comparison has shown that several of the stories related in the travels of Marco Polo turn out to be from sources other than Marco himself. Sources that include other, earlier works written by Rusticello, 
you have to be careful how much of the travels you believe. In fact, believing everything in the travels of Marco Polo is hampered by yet another problem. The original of the book doesn't exist. Instead, what remains in various museums and libraries around the world are copies painstakingly made by hand over the centuries, and then translated, and then hand-copied again, and then translated again. And if you've ever tried the game with Google Translate, where you put a phrase in one end, translate it through two or three languages, and then see what comes back out in the original language, you can see why it is hard to say anything definitive about the contents or veracity of Marco Polo's original tales. These are but some of the reasons a lot of people think Marco Polo never really went to China, and maybe never left Venice. There are too many discrepancies between what Polo says happened and what really might have or could have happened. The book refers to the Mongol Empire as a sophisticated civilization. But everyone knew, in the same way that everyone knows things about other people now, that the Mongols were barely more than barbarians, thanks to earlier accounts from other travelers in the region. Marco completely fails to mention important Chinese things like chopsticks and tea and Chinese characters and, oh yeah, the Great Wall of China, which you'd think he would have noticed at some point in his travels. He doesn't even mention place names anyone else has ever heard of, so how could he have gone to China at all? He probably just made it all up to entertain his cellmate and get a book out of it. Marco Polo was just a big faker. Some of the things we think we know about Marco Polo are, of course, patently untrue. He didn't steal the secrets of pasta from the Chinese and bring it to Italy, nor did he smuggle out silkworms or their cocoons so that Europe could make its own silk. Neither of those things happened, neither of them is true, and neither of them comes from the travels of Marco Polo. They just got made up and repeated somewhere along the way simply because Polo was the most well-known Italian to have gone to China early enough to sound convincing. It pays to be careful what you say when you are talking about Marco and the book about his travels. But by the same token, some of the things folks have thought weren't true over the years turn out to have been true all along, or at least very plausible and extremely likely. Just because Marco didn't mention the Great Wall of China doesn't mean he didn't go to China. Lots of Europeans who were known to have been in China and who also wrote about it also failed to mention the Great Wall, probably because while it definitely existed and remnants of it were still around, it just wasn't all that significant or noteworthy because it was in disrepair and because the people who it had been built to keep out by the time Marco got on scene were the people who were in charge. Not only was the Great Wall insignificant, but it also hadn't worked particularly well. Also, it wasn't even the same wall. The one we're familiar with today was built two centuries after Marco Polo. Besides, Polo was a bit of a mythbuster himself. Numerous entries in the book take the time to debunk earlier stories told by other travelers. It turns out there were no needless wild men, pygmy pygmies, women monsters married to dogmen, and other such fantastical horrors as Western travelers often use to spice up their own stories of the world. In fact, Marco's accounts are oftentimes more accurate and more detailed than any of those who went before, and it is noted that when he did mention the occasional fantastical attraction, he was very clear about whether it was something he was told about or something he saw for himself. Polo actually set the record straight on several occasions. But where Marco really hits a home run, and either very convincingly lied about minute details he had never seen, or actually went to China and saw things for himself, is in his business dealings. In 2012, a detailed analysis of Polo's stories, especially those that included details of currencies he had seen and notes about salt production and revenue, showed that Polo would have actually had to have gone to China to know the things he knew. He gave accurate descriptions about the size, shape, denominations, and seals used on Chinese currency, as well as variations on that currency in different regions of China. When historical salt records were compared with details given by Polo, they matched up 
and these details, taken together with other bits of information, show that Polo's reports of his travels were, by and large, authentic. One of the biggest disputes about the book, though, may be what role Marco says he played within the courts of Kublai Khan. See, one of the major points of the trip was so that his uncle and father could report back to Kublai Khan, and Kublai was still so enamored of the pair, and subsequently enamored with Marco, that he began putting them in charge of various things around his empire. Some accounts have it that Polo was appointed governor over some area of the Khan's land. Others have it that he served as a diplomat to various portions of the empire as needed, or perhaps he was a minor government official or a tax collector. Most of the guesses around what Marco Polo did and what role he fulfilled at the Mongol courts are brought about by the various translations, interpretations, and other corruptions of the original stories. All that is known for sure at this point is that he was there and he had some official duty. Given the prevalence of information on the salt monopoly in China, it is most likely that Polo was a government officer in charge of some of that monopoly. But all that is really beside the point. The stories in the book weren't really meant to be tales of thrilling adventure and daring do. Sure, some of them came out that way, but by and large that was not the intent of the original telling. Nor was it a travelogue. It wasn't about the act of traveling itself. Instead, the book that made Marco Polo famous was meant as a handbook for merchants. The book explained the various customs Marco encountered during his travels and introduced some new ideas and commodities to up-and-coming traders. All very useful stuff. In fact, it is from Marco Polo that the West learned about things like gunpowder, coal, and even paper money. But more importantly, within its pages were texts on weights, measures, and distances. In other words, it was a way to understand and convert the various different measurements a merchant was likely to run into in different regions of the world, so they would always know what their goods were worth, no matter where they might go, along with instructions on how to get where the goods might be most profitable. And once there, it explained how to get along with the locals. And apparently, the book was so popular, as well as useful, that even Christopher Columbus carried a copy around on his voyages. In subsequent years, the details provided by the travels of Marco Polo were significant and well recorded enough to help inform a man named Frau Morrow when it came time, about 200 years later, to create the most accurate map of the world medieval Europe had ever seen. The Frau Morrow map, about which we just did a whole footnote episode for our supporters on Patreon, was so accurate that hundreds of years later, when we could finally look back at the Earth from space, even NASA was impressed with it. All told, Marco Polo and his relations spent something like 17 years in service to Kublai Khan. By all reports, they had a wonderful time, saw many of the sites in the Mongol Empire, and were greatly admired and trusted by Kublai Khan himself. Though, eventually, this would prove to be a problem. The Khan was known to distrust his Chinese subjects, and for this reason, he often brought foreigners on board to help run the country. And one of the problems you run into, in almost any organization, not just the courts of the Khan, is that if you are really good at your job, and the boss really likes you... No one wants to see you go. And the Khan didn't want to see Marco and company go. Sure, they'd been there 17 years and done lots of good for Kubla and everyone was on friendly terms, but when the Polos started getting a bit homesick and asked about going back to Venice, the Khan said no. And the more they asked, the more he said no, until it was really awkward and maybe even dangerous to keep asking. Because when a con wants you to remain a part of the organization, he has ways of keeping you on the team. And then something unexpected happened. The Polos were increasingly desperate to get back home. Though, it's worth noting that home might be where the heart is, but it certainly wasn't where the Polos' bodies had been for most of their lives. Marco had spent at least half his life away from Venice at this point, while his father and uncle were coming up on 30 years away, all told, probably more. In any case, this was only part of the reason they wanted to leave. See, Kublai was getting on in years, and the Polos, with their keen sense of coming political change, could see how it might not be the best idea to be foreign and in the Mongol Empire, especially not as noted officials of the old Khan, when the new Khan decided to take the throne. These sorts of things, they had observed, tended to get messy. 
So, desperate as they were to get back home, and with the con saying no in a slightly more significant voice each time they asked, it must have seemed like a small miracle when a Mongol princess turned up and got herself married off to Argun Khan of the Persian Empire. And she needed an escort, familiar with the ways of that part of the world, to get her there. After a little wrangling, Kublai Khan agreed to let them go and take the princess safely to her destination. So the Polos, and 600 or so of the princess's retinue, loaded up on some boats and sailed away from the Mongol Empire, and eventually, though it did take them so long that Argun Khan died and the princess had to be presented to his son, they dropped the princess off and headed back to Venice. And then, a little while later, Marco was arrested by the Genoese when he attacked them with a small fleet of ships, he told his story to his cellmate, the book was published, and the world got its first real taste of the wonders of what would become known as the Silk Road which is really fascinating. So much happened because of and on the Silk Road that the entire world owes a debt to it. Without some of the things and people that traveled the Silk Road, the world wouldn't be nearly as far along as it is. And we think that's pretty important. So important, in fact, that we'll spend the rest of the month discussing and sharing some of the history and the significance of the Silk Road with you like the fact that there wasn't just one Silk Road. We're happy you joined us for this episode of GM Word of the Week, and we hope you'll stick around through at least the rest of February to hear all the stuff we have about the Silk Road and its influences. Undoubtedly, you'll be surprised by at least a few things you hear. Once again, we'd like to encourage you to help support the show. If we provide you with entertainment and useful information to share around the water cooler or incorporate into your games, consider a small contribution on Patreon to help keep the show going strong. We provide transcripts and release episodes early to our supporters for as little as a dollar an episode. It's a heck of a deal, and we can't believe you haven't taken advantage of it yet. Unless you have, in which case, thank you for generously supporting the show and making us what we are today. You're very kind. To find out more, head over to gmwordoftheweek.com, click the yellow banner at the top, and select the Patreon option. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Brian, Marco, Casey, Polo. Music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. It's not the voice that commands the story, it is the ear.